Welcome back to Sorry What. I'm Jason, your storyteller. Truthfully, today's story made my head hurt. Grab your favorite drink, find a chill spot, and let's dive into this story. Maybe problems were inevitable. I was a natural scientist, physics if you must know, and Tilly was an economist, solidly in the social sciences. We didn't work in those fields, but our college majors were major tells about how each of us thought. I believed in absolutes. Not in every single thing, but there are many things that are true no matter the circumstance. Natural laws, like gravity. Tilly believed in truths too, but her mind always left room for exceptions. Even for gravity. It's always true, Till. Gravity is immutable. So far. You can't believe that somewhere out there in this infinite universe there's not a single instance where it might not apply. Not a chance. Then we laughed. Neither of us ever convinced the other, but we enjoyed the repartee. We had a good marriage that way. We weren't going to challenge Gates or Bezos for money, but I got into big data management via actuarial analysis, while Tully ran a sales group of two dozen for a regional brokerage company that was growing like crazy. We had plenty of money for both the present and the future. We owned a nice four-bedroom home with an in-ground pool and hot tub, and we split the mortgage on a cabin up north with Tilly's sister Margie and husband Nate, so we had a place to escape to when summer came, and the temperatures climbed. Our older daughter Annette, Annie, had started first grade, and our younger Kylie was just shedding her diapers. Not only was each of them absolutely adorable, they were both energetic and well-behaved too. I was hinting around for a third child, maybe a boy this time, but Tilly wasn't as enthusiastic. Which was cool. She had to carry the babies, and after Kylie it took her nearly two years to get back to her fighting weight and tone. I could see where her hesitation came from. It certainly wasn't a deal breaker for me. And sex. I don't think there's such a thing as bad sex, and I certainly enjoyed our time in bed. And sofa. And hot tub. And hammock, although that took some extra care. No slamming round in that. We probably weren't the most adventurous lovers in the world, but we were no prudes either. She really liked me to go down on her, and I really liked it too, so that was a frequent part of our repertoire. I loved plowing her from behind, because I could be my most energetic. I also loved her peach, and holding her hips while I went to town always revved me way up. Tilly seemed to finish most when she was on top. We didn't often finish with missionary, but it was the most intimate position for us both, so we usually spent at least a little time there when we made love. And often a lot of time. Our marriage was well balanced. Sometimes I was up, taking more than I gave when I had a big project at work, or when dad had his stroke, and mom needed my help around the house. But just as often I was down, giving more so Tilly could handle a business trip to new prospects, or stay with her sister for a week after Margie's breast cancer diagnosis. I think both of us would say the scales are ultimately balanced though. So where did we go wrong? The seeds of our discontent were sown from the beginning of our relationship. We were who we were, but I don't think either of us quite believed it about the other. We assumed that our differences weren't profound, and so I suppose we didn't discuss our expectations completely enough. I loved her, and she loved me. What else mattered? A whole lot more, as it turns out. At least that's what I'm left with now. Who knows if it's true. Tilly always understood people better than me. Even if we'd taken a wrong turn in the beginning it took a while for it to be exposed. Yours, in fact. We were living pretty blissful lives, all the while unaware of the fissure that lay below our marriage. Daddy, why don't I leave and I get to go too? Annie was precocious and more than a little spoiled. Tilly and I adored both our children, and we included them far more often than we left them with babysitters or our own parents to watch. But Tilly was going to be recognized by the CEO of her firm for landing three very large accounts, a software titan and two family offices, that together controlled over $2 billion in assets, and we decided to spend the night at the hotel where the celebration was taking place. Because this party is for grown-ups only, sweetie. But I promise that we'll go out and celebrate as a family tomorrow night. Okay. I wish I could go with you. I know, sweetie. But tomorrow night you will. Fate is too often decided by inconsequential details, the minutia that's like the blood cells flowing through our bodies. Abundant, ubiquitous, and individually almost trivial. Almost. I had parked the car, Tilly's midnight blue BMW 5 series sedan, and we were in the elevator going up when I realized I'd forgotten the parking ticket. If it had been a municipal lot I would have just paid the 5 bucks, but this hotel charged $40 to park overnight, so I kissed Tilly when the elevator reached the lobby, ushered her out, and then pushed the button to return to the second level. I was coming through the doors with the ticket in my coat pocket about 5 minutes after Tilly had walked in. I could see that she'd shed her coat and was talking to a tall man in a dark suit and another woman wearing a silk dress of vibrant green. The woman was long and lean, athletic, but Tilly outshone her. 
My wife wore classic clothes of quality, and she wore them with confidence. Her proportions were nearly perfect, both the features in her face, as well as the build of her body. She looked womanly, with full curves that she kept firm with an hour-long workout nearly every day, but it was the intelligence in her eyes, the mirth in the curve of her lip, that won my heart. And seeing her across the room I felt the familiar swelling for her in my heart. And other places too. It was appropriate that it was that moment when the lie was exposed. I see Tilly didn't bring her husband. Do you think Randy is going to tap her again tonight? I was at the coat chuck, and two men had turned away just as I slipped in behind them, so they never saw me. I remember Ted Masters. He'd been on Tilly's team for three years. I didn't recognize the other man, but I knew Randy. He was a tall man talking to Tilly. I've never experienced anything like I felt at that moment. Certainly not before, and not since either. I knew I was in unfathomable pain, a torment that might never release me from its grip. The wound was so deep and so consuming that I wondered if I'd be able to survive it. I didn't know how I'd cope with it. And yet I didn't feel it. My instinct for self-preservation kicked in with a vengeance. It willed off the agony immediately, and while I wouldn't be able to stave it off forever, I wasn't going to let myself be humiliated either. I don't know if it's true for all men, but I didn't want to show vulnerability in public. My mind was far from clear, but my survival mode let me make decisions that I look back on with a measure of gratitude. I walked over to Tilly wearing a grim face that she was slow to notice. The coat check is by the entrance, honey. And would you please get me a glass of white wine on your way back? I didn't waste time or words. I'm leaving, Tilly. She looked at me, puzzled. I wouldn't want to get in the way of Randy tapping you tonight. Again. Randy spewed the whiskey he just sipped. Tilly's eyes went wide, and she gaped at me. But as she looked into my eyes, she saw that I knew about her affair. Her face fell and her eyes filled with tears. Oh, no, she whispered, quietly horrified, as I turned and walked away, passing Ted Masters who'd heard everything I'd said. He looked white as a sheet. Air. Tilly called. Please wait. I'll get my coat and be with you in just a second. I ignored her and kept walking. I took the stairs quickly. I wasn't going to run, but I wasn't dawdling either. I got out of the garage without seeing her. And I was parked for such a short time that I didn't have to pay for the parking either. Who says the universe doesn't bend towards justice? Thank God the girls were with Tilly's parents overnight. As I drove I made plans. Worst case I had a 4 or 5 minute head start. If she made apologies to the execs I'd have a couple more. If she had to wait for a rideshare cab, that could give me up to 10 minutes more. Regardless, I couldn't spend much time at home. Like any wounded animal I wanted to get to some place safe, some place where no one could see my suffering and my shame for how it would break me. Because I knew it would break me. Soon. I needed to get some things together and get out, but I wasn't sure I'd be able to do that before Tilly got home. I knew I wasn't operating anywhere near peak efficiency. And I most definitely wasn't ready to see her. Then I laughed. I wouldn't need to go home. I had an overnight bag in the trunk. I wasn't going to hide, but I wouldn't make it easy either. I found an ATM and withdrew the maximum, then found a residence inn where I paid cash for the night. I turned off my phone and left it in my room while I went to the Red Robin next door for a burger and salad and a draft beer. But only one. I never saw the point of drinking to excess. The data was pretty clearly against it. I didn't need to punish myself, the pain would take care of that just fine. I lingered at Red Robin. As long as I was in public I thought I could parry my pain effectively enough to pretend I'd be okay. I feared being alone in my room, but I was drawn towards it nonetheless. My facade was about to crumble. I left bills on the table and walked out. The waitress would be thrilled with the tip, but I just didn't think that I'd survive the wait for my change. As soon as I was behind the locked door the sobs overtook me. I grabbed a pillow from the bed and wrapped it around my face. A howl poured forth from deep, deep inside my ravaged heart, and if anyone could have heard it, I'm sure it would have shaken them to their core. I shrieked and cried and gave vent to all the agony that twisted my guts and rent my heart. I don't know how long I screamed into that pillow, but when I finally slumped to the floor, it was soaked with spit and tears and mucus. I tossed it into a corner. There were three more on the bed and two others stashed on the shelf in the closet. I knew I'd need at least some of them before I left in the morning. Tilly. I had devastated my husband. I'm leaving, Tilly. I wouldn't want to get in the way of Randy tapping you tonight. Again. Aaron's voice was cold, but his eyes betrayed his pain. He knew. My breath caught in my throat. I wanted to reach out, to cradle him, use my love to soothe his grief, but I froze instead. I don't remember if I said anything at all while our eyes held each other, but when he turned his back and walked brusquely past that I snapped out of my stupor. Air. Please wait. I'll get my coat and be with you in just a second. He kept walking. 
I followed him. I thought about making my apologies to Jim and Frank, but work was way down my list of priorities at the moment. Nothing mattered except Aaron. I walked quickly to the coat check to retrieve my coat, and then punched the button for the elevator to the garage. I know it didn't do any good, but I pushed it every few seconds until the doors opened. Once in the garage it took a few seconds to see that my car was gone, so I rode the elevator back to the lobby and went out the front doors. Cabs were few and far between, so I hired a ride with my phone. Ahmed and his blue Prius arrived 4 minutes later. The 20 minute ride felt like the longest of my life. I texted both Jim and Frank and told them Aaron had become suddenly ill and gave my regrets. I got texts back immediately expressing their disappointment that we would miss this recognition, but also their understanding. They both hoped Aaron felt better soon. With that task handled I returned to Aaron. So many thoughts collided, but my overarching thought was more of a fear. I knew Aaron saw everything in black and white. That had never been a problem. I loved him for his clarity, his integrity. And for his intellect and his sense of playfulness and his devotion to our girls and to me and to our family. But where I saw things as conditional he had certainty. I didn't know what our future held, of course, but I knew he would have a much harder time moving forward and I would have had the circumstances be reversed. But of course they wouldn't be. His commitment to me was total. My commitment to him was just as strong, but sexual fidelity seemed irrelevant to my marriage. The sex didn't intrude on our time together. It in no way affected my feelings for my husband, which grew stronger and more full with every passing day. I could be completely committed and still have the occasional fling if it didn't affect Aaron or the girls or anyone else in our family. Not that I was a slut. I slept with Randy for the first time about a year before, nearly two years after he joined the firm. And we'd only had sex twice more since then, always on the road, and not even on every trip. We never spent the night together. I never left town thinking I'd duck around on Aaron. It only happened if circumstances aligned, the biggest of those circumstances being if I was horny, and my prospective playmate was also just interested in some passing fun. I'd had only one other tourist since being married, a one-night stand with a stereotypical salesman for a manufacturing company. So four dalliances spread over five years. Two or three hours total. Hardly a big deal. I'd had way more massages than that. But I knew Aaron wouldn't see things the same way. When Ahmed dropped me off, the house was dark, and there was no sign Aaron had been there since we left it not even an hour ago. I moved through our home, the home that we peopled with Annie and Kylie, that we filled with mementos from our families and our lives together. I felt sad, and I felt scared. Sad that now our memories would include this wound, and scared of the changes it would mean to our marriage, to our children, to our family. It would be a long time before our lives returned to their previous states. If they ever could. I changed into comfy sweats and slept into my sheepskin mules, and went to the family room to wait for Aaron. I had no new texts, and we never did that find my phone thing, so I couldn't say where he might be. I thought about what to say to him, but I couldn't come up with anything. We needed to talk. Despite my reaction at the hotel, I was good at processing in the moment, and I was always more effective when I could see and sense nuance from tone, eye contact, body language. If I could sit across from Aaron, or better yet next to him, I could see and hear and feel his reactions to our conversation. I didn't know if I could convince him of my perspectives, but the chances were better in person. So I'd wait for him, however long it took. But I also wanted him to know that I loved him, and that he was the most important person in the world to me. I thought for nearly 15 minutes, starting at least a dozen texts before settling on a simple one. PLS come home to talk to me. I love you. Then I waited. Aaron? I slept remarkably well. I had one more screaming fit before falling into a dreamless sleep. It was still early when I awoke, but as near as I could tell I'd been out for about 9 hours. I guess emotional exhaustion does that. I still felt off though, like I was wading through mud, both physically and mentally. I showered but skipped a shave. It was about 7.30 when I ventured out to the original pancake house. The coffee was fresh and hot, and the pancakes were lighter than I expected. About the only thing I didn't care for was the sausage patty, it was particularly greasy. But the bill wasn't even 20 bucks, so I left another generous tip. I felt restless. My usual workout was a run, but I didn't have workout clothes, and I'd completely forgotten to pack another pair of shoes. But I didn't want to sit around a hotel room, so I bundled up the best I could in a couple t-shirts, my dress shirt from the night before, and a hoodie I packed to wear home, and I walked the park trails near the shore of the nearby lake. Aside from a couple of runners and a mom with two boys climbing on the play structure, the park was deserted. Which gave me plenty of time to think. And I needed to think. I did best when I knew the questions that needed answers. Tilly's mind was flexible, and it processed at light speed. 
If I didn't have an outline to give me structure and focus for our discussion, then I'd be at a decided disadvantage. I had no idea how she could justify her unfaithfulness, but I had no doubt that she'd try. I believed that she loved me, or at least she thought she did, but for the life of me, I couldn't reconcile that with her behavior. So I walked, hearing the sound of water making its unhurried way to shore, smelling the lake and the dormant grass and the dirt and the trees, breathing the crisp air. And I did what I did best. Organized my thoughts into categories, and then tried to articulate the essential issues. I dismissed the trivial or distracting or irrelevant and refined the questions that would hopefully give me the answers I needed. I ordered the questions in my mind. I refined them, supplemented them with clarifying language. And when I returned to my hotel room I wrote them down. I didn't plan on reading them to Tilly, but writing down ideas always cemented them in my mind. First, why did she think she could trash her vows, her commitments to me? I had little hope that her answer would be satisfactory, but I still wanted to understand. Second, did she put my health at risk by having unprotected sex? If so, then she was at best thoughtless about me and at worst cavalier. Third, how often had she slept with Randy? And were there any others? She could try to shade her answer, but she was fundamentally an honest person. She was not a good liar. And I was good at discerning lies. Fourth, why Randy? Did she love him? Want a relationship with him? Did she want to continue ducking him? Fifth, how did her co-workers know about their liaisons? Were they flagrant? Work spouses? Was the company culture rotten with infidelity? Finally, how did she think we should proceed? The path forward wouldn't be completely her choice, but I was curious to know what she thought should happen. I knew I needed to face Tilly, and I knew that it had to happen today or tomorrow. My priority was to protect the kids, and that meant until Tilly and I decided on a path the girls needed to come home to a house that included both parents. I felt mentally ready, but I was still edgy, agitated. I needed to relax as much as possible, focus as much energy on the conversation, instead of leaking it out with fidgeting and mind trips. The hotel had a small gym with a treadmill, so I walked for another hour in my jeans, t-shirt and dress shoes. Then I went to Red Robin for a BLT and side salad with coffee. Exercised and fed, I was probably as ready as I'd ever be. Tilly. I woke up on the sofa with a sore neck. I checked my phone while I rolled my head around, but there was nothing of consequence. I knew Aaron would need to process his feelings, but the longer he was incommunicado the harder my task would be. I could picture him vividly, as he formulated and tested hypotheses, ran scenarios, trying desperately to make order out of what he didn't understand. I felt weird being the subject of his deliberations. Sad too. Bill pressed in on me. I knew that I would be honest when Aaron came to me, and I knew that my honesty would hurt him. I hoped it would also cleanse his wound. I wouldn't allow lies between us. Lies fester and infect any intimate relationship. I have liked to save someone's feelings if it didn't otherwise matter, but this was way too important. Only full truth would work. Might work. It all rested on Aaron. I made coffee and tried to put the looming conversation out of my mind. I was best when others thought me underprepared, but anticipating possibilities always left me flat. I had a knack for reading the moment and intuitively understanding the issues to address. And I articulated quickly too. So I didn't want to spend too much time thinking about topics and questions that might not even come up. I wanted to save my energy for when it mattered. The morning dragged on with no word from Aaron. I called my folks to check on the kids and asked them to keep the girls another night, which they were happy to do. Then Annie wanted to talk to me. Daddy said we're gonna celebrate tonight. Celebrate. I'm sorry, sweetheart, but daddy isn't feeling well today. But I promise we'll go out as a family as soon as we can. But daddy said tonight. Annie looked more like me, but she was her father's daughter in every other way. I know, sweetie. But sometimes we have to change our plans when things happen. We'll go out as soon as we can. The silence lingered until mom got back on the phone. She chuckled. Someone isn't very happy at all. She's making the angry face you used to make. Thanks mom. If anyone can handle her it's you. Nothing a couple cookies can't solve. Tell Aaron we hope he's feeling better soon. I will. Give Kylie a hug too. I put in a load of laundry and then tidied up the kitchen. I didn't want to do anything that I couldn't drop as soon as Aaron came home. The problem was there weren't enough small jobs to keep me busy, so I was starting to obsess about Aaron. I kept reminding myself that I couldn't know his reaction until I saw him, so spinning on it was fruitless, but with nothing else to occupy me, I kept doing it. I thought about showering, but I wanted him to see me as soon as he walked in the door. He needed to know that he was the most important person to me in the world, now and always. It might drive me crazy, but waiting for him was a small penance, so I'd do it. But it might actually drive me crazy. I hate being idle. 
with nothing else to help me pass the time I prompted memories. Memories of Aaron and me. They always made me happy. Our first date. A standard dinner and a movie. He suggested Italian for dinner, a safe choice, and inside Loon Davis, a risky one. We shared an enormous lasagna, and I took home his spaghetti carbonara. We learned that we both liked the Coen brothers, although I thought Raising Arizona was their best, while he was enamored with Barton Fink. Honestly, I never really liked Barton Fink. The first time we made love. My sister Margie and I were living together as I finished up my degree. She had left for the weekend. We never said it, but it was no secret that Aaron and I were going to have sex that night. He showed up with a Chianti, we ate pizza, and then went to my bedroom. I was a little nervous, and he said he was too, but it didn't show. He moved me around confidently, he varied the pace and depth of his thrusts, and he told me throughout our first coupling how excited I made him. And that helped me to nibble and suck and blow him hard and write him the way I liked for our second go. I was very sore the next morning, it had been a few months since my last sex, but that didn't stop us from another couple of sessions, and we spent so much time doing it, I was still in the shower when Margie returned. His proposal. We talked about marriage, and he let a couple prime opportunities pass, Christmas and New Year's, but then he found the perfect way. It was a regular Thursday night. We were at his apartment, and he made Panela Vodka, his go-to date dinner. He'd rented a rival, and when it was over he worked our discussion around to the central question of the film. If you knew heartbreak waited at the end, would you still take the plunge? In the movie it was about the daughter's sickness, but his conversation centered on the failed marriage. Would you still get married knowing it might end badly? When I said I would, he went to his knee, produced a ring, and said, I would too. Prophetic, right? I certainly hope not. And then, as if I had conjured him, I heard the garage door go up. I took three breaths, deep, deeper, deepest, and sat at the kitchen table, so I'd be the first thing he saw when he came in. Aaron. I opened the door from the garage to the kitchen and slipped through. The first thing I saw was Tilly sitting at the kitchen table with a cup of coffee in front of her. She looked strained. I guess I wasn't the only one suffering. I'd forgotten that this situation was new for her too. Thank God you're home, honey. I was so worried about you. Are you alright? Can I get you something? Coffee? Lunch? Tilly's words came in a rush, her anxiety plain. No. I already ate. I'm going to change. Then we'll talk. Okay, Han. I'm going to fix some eggs. I've been too worried to eat. Are you sure you don't want any? Positive. I glanced into the family room as I went to the stairs. The room was the emotional center of our house, but it felt off. In fact, the whole vibe in the house was off. I didn't notice anything different about it, the throw on the sectional was balled up, I assumed from Tilly, but the usual feeling of solidity was absent. I'd always felt most grounded when I was home, but I didn't feel that way now. I guess that's another outcome of her betrayal. My home no longer felt special. Our bedroom felt stale too. I unpacked a bag, laying the suit over the chair that seemed destined to hold clothes. T-shirts and jeans went into the hamper with my socks and boxers. I put away my toiletries and hung my hoodie in the closet. I pulled on a pair of track pants and a long sleeve t-shirt, then added my favorite cotton sweater. I pulled on my sketchers and returned to the kitchen. Tilly was at the stove, stirring her eggs, which smelled really good. No diner could ever replicate those eggs. The girls loved them. I sat across from where she left her mug. Tilly always preferred to sit together when we discussed anything important, but this situation was different. We were in opposing corners, which felt unnerving, but sitting across from her would let me see her reactions. I took a deep breath, quietly, and let it out slowly. I mentally reviewed my questions. I was as ready as I'd ever be. Tilly. When Aaron came in he looked, well, different. His clothes were mismatched, he wore his cordovan wingtips with tan jeans and a green hoodie, and he hadn't shaved, which was really unlike him. But it was his eyes that I really noticed. I didn't expect to see the usual joy that percolated every time he saw me, but I didn't see anger or hurt in them either. I did see distance, and almost clinical detachment. He was in business mode. I needed him in husband mode, the mode we had when we solved problems together, when we decided anything of consequence in our marriage and for our family. I had my work cut out for me. Thank God you're home, honey. I was so worried about you. Are you alright? Can I get you something? Coffee? Lunch? No. I already ate. I'm going to change. Then we'll talk. Definitely business mode. Okay, Han. I'm going to fix some eggs. I've been too worried to eat. Are you sure you don't want any? Positive. He went upstairs. I scrambled three eggs with milk and salt, and then added some shredded parmesan. The girls love their eggs this way. Well, Annie did, Kylie liked them because her older sister did. 
The eggs were cooking slowly when Aaron returned and sat opposite from my place. I heard him exhale slowly. This conversation was too important to start this way. I needed him relaxed, sitting next to me so he could feel my love, sense my sincerity. I don't want to do this in the kitchen Aaron. I'll leave quickly and we can go to the family room. The family room had the bulk of our pictures and the girls' toys and the souvenirs from our honeymoon, and the family keepsakes we'd received from our folks and grandparents. It was our place of love, and he needed to feel that love. And so did I. The kitchen is fine. Crap. I couldn't fight him on this. I didn't want to fight him on anything. We needed connections, not more ruptures. But he wasn't making it easy. Okay. But can we wait until I finish eating? I want to give you my full attention. Sure. I stirred the eggs. Where did you stay last night? Residence Inn. I see you brought your bag home with you. Will you be here tonight? I haven't decided. I told Annie we'd go out as a family to celebrate your ward. I called mom and asked them to keep the kids another night. I wasn't sure if you'd be home. I sent Sarah a nod. Good call. How did Annie take the news? I laughed and I felt him smile too. Just the way you think. It was good to talk about the girls. I could sense some relax just a tad. I plated the eggs and then took the seat adjacent to Aaron, which surprised him. Emboldened, I touched his forearm. He flinched. I sighed. I'm sorry Aaron. He shrugged. I ate quickly, not tasting the eggs. After putting my plate and fork in the dishwasher, I refreshed my coffee and sat next to him again. He gathered himself and sat up a little straighter. Business mode. I have some questions about the affair too. It wasn't an affair, honey. It was sex. Irregular sex at that. Call it what you want. I think of it as an affair. Why did you do it? I can see how much I've hurt you with what I've done, honey. And I'll answer any and all questions that you have. But it meant nothing to me. I want you to see that it just doesn't matter, to me or to us. But I don't know how to help you understand that. Why did you do it? The same reason I sometimes order steak for dinner and sometimes have a salad. Randy is good looking, funny, humble, he's just a fun guy. We landed a big account, so we went out to eat, had some drinks to celebrate, and flirted a bit like we always do. I was feeling horny and so was he. He raised his eyebrows, I laughed and stood up, we went to his room. I left when we finished. You haven't said why. I had, but I recognized this as our Gordian nod. Usually our different approaches were complementary, an enviable strength that served us well no matter the topic. This time they worked against us. We knew each other well from close observation, but if we were going to get through this as a team we needed to inhabit each other's reality. I needed him to really see that Randy, and the salesman for that matter, was about as threatening to our marriage as a gym workout. I'm trying to help you see that my time with Randy was insignificant. Like what I ordered for dinner. It had nothing to do with you, with our marriage, with our family. We were on the road, and it just happened. I can take issue with just about everything you just said, Till. It is significant, it has everything to do with me, our marriage, and our family, and it didn't just happen. You made commitments to me when we married. To know that you trashed them has really shifted the ground beneath me. I have always honored my commitments to you Aaron. Always. I love you and cherish you more now than I ever have. I love you so much it overwhelms me at times. This thing with Randy means nothing. It means everything. What does it mean? I wasn't here. You didn't miss out on anything. And when I came home I was just as loving and attentive and supportive and engaged as I've always been. It didn't change me or our marriage or our family one bit. You lied to me. I didn't lie. I've never lied to you about anything important. Withholding the truth about something important is the same as lying about it. Exactly. It wasn't important. I don't tell you when I work out on the road, what I eat for breakfast, what cars I rent. It felt just like that. It didn't mean anything. I wouldn't lie to you, Han, not about anything that matters. He inhaled slowly and closed his eyes for a moment. Recentering. Did you use a condom? His question surprised me a bit. I thought I had been making progress in gaining his understanding, so the change in direction disrupted me. Still, I had promised to answer all of his questions. This was going to be hard, but I knew it would come out at some point. Not the first time. After that, yes. How many times was it then? I was with Randy three times. Aaron clenched his jaw. On the one hand I hoped his anger would cloud his thinking, but then ripping off the band-aid is usually the best way. He didn't miss my precision. Were you ever with anyone else? Only one other man. Once. Many years ago. I met him in the hotel and we hit it off. No one besides him and Randy. I see. He was pissed. His eyes were dark and cold, and his face was tight. 
But now all my dirty laundry was in the open. I just had to help him see how little it mattered to everything we had made together. Have you been tested for STDs? What? No. The first guy and I did use a condom, and with Randy, it was only the ones without. So you have put my health at risk? No, honey, no. I'm sure Randy didn't have anything. He hadn't been with anyone except his wife. What if you lied? What if she ducks around like you? Ouch. I almost retorted, but I caught my tongue in time. I'd hurt him, badly. He was getting a measure of payback. I sighed. I needed to be understanding. But it still stung. It was more than a year ago that I had unprotected sex, but I will get tested if you want me to. It seems like the least you could do. Okay. I'll arrange it. Anything to make you feel better. That hardly makes me feel better. But it is one less thing to worry about. He frowned, then relaxed and made a quick nod. So you've had sex with Randy three times in the last year? Yes. But it's not what you're imagining. It's never been planned. We've probably gone on a dozen trips together in that time. When it happened it's just because we were both in a mood for it. We only did it once each time. We've never spent a night together. We've never shared a room. Are you in love with Randy? In love? God, no. I mean, I like him, but I love you. I could never love him. Or anyone else. You my man, my partner, the love of my life. But you duck Randy. And some other guy. I sighed again. How could I get him past the sex part to see there was never one iota of love involved in any of it. It was a diversion. Like going to a movie or a concert. I hated seeing him so upset, and because of me. I had to find the words that would heal him. I don't know how to get you to see that every one of those times was nothing at all. Just scratching an itch. What can I do to help you understand? I do understand. You think sex can be casual. No attachment. No emotion. Yes. You do see it. I felt my insides unbind. Maybe we could make it through this crisis. I see it. I just don't agree. Oh, come on, honey. Sometimes we make love gently and sweetly, and sometimes we bang the crap out of each other. Sex can be done a lot of different ways, be a lot of different things, cover a lot of different ground. Yes, but no matter how we're doing it, I'm always doing it with you. And only with you. That makes it special. It's special for me too. I love sex with you. It's wonderful. So fulfilling. But you duck other guys too. He was still stuck. I didn't know how many ways I could say it, but I had to keep trying. And it doesn't mean anything to me. It does to me. He put his hand over his mouth and squinted in concentration. Recentering again. I was about to speak when he beat me to it. How many people know about it? What do you mean? No one knows about it. He scoffed. People definitely know about it. How do you think I found out? Of all the questions he could have asked, this was one I hadn't remotely considered. It never occurred to me. It was enough that Aaron knew. I guess I thought he deduced it, since he was so good at that, but I never thought someone else might have told him. I was stunned. Who told you? No one told me. I overheard Ted Winter saying something about it to another guy last night. It didn't seem like a secret to them. Wow. I was stunned. My co-workers knew. This had the makings of a full-blown disaster. I immediately saw the implications. My professional reputation was at severe risk. At least some of my team knew I'd slept with a subordinate, and that could mean HR issues, which in turn could mean discipline from Jim and Frank. And what about Randy? He could claim harassment, though I was confident I could ultimately survive that accusation. But his wife was standing with us when Aaron dropped his bombshell, so he might be having his own marital crisis right now. And people can get squirrely under stress. I shook my head. I love my job, but it was only that in the end. A job. I deal with work once Aaron and I resolved our issues. Aaron was my husband, my true love, my anchor, my partner. We needed to fix our marriage. Nothing else mattered nearly as much as that. I really needed to tap into his love for me, show him that nothing had changed between us because of my flings. Honey, it doesn't matter who else knows. You know, and I see how much you're hurt. I want to help you heal from your pain. You're the one who inflicted this pain. I don't trust you to believe me. His words put my heart in my throat. Before I could respond he said, what do you see happening here? Thank God. His question had just put me on the firmest possible ground. I love you more now than I ever have, Air. And I'll love you even more tomorrow. This is just noise, honey. I know it hurts, but I can love away that pain. It's trivial compared to the love we have for each other, for the family we build together. We still have our wonderful future ahead of us, everything we've always talked about. I know that you're hurt and that we have a lot of work to do. But I know we can do it. I'm more certain now than ever before that we're destined to spend our lives together. 
he didn't reply. He looked into the middle distance, and his face remained impassive. Let's go into the family room and sit together. I miss touching you, holding you. We always feel better when we touch. You'll see that nothing's changed. I'm fine staying here. He wasn't moving, and I don't mean from the kitchen. He wasn't moving from his business mode, and that wasn't going to work. We didn't see the world the same way, and we never would. I couldn't bridge the intellectual gap. I needed to get him to see that our feelings were what mattered, our emotional connections, and that ours were strong and resilient. He was feeling a lot of emotional pain, and that would only heal with emotional sucker. He wasn't going to be able to rationalize his way to feeling better. Honey, your pain is raw and it's overwhelming you right now. Please don't lock me out. Let me help you find your center. Feel my support. He stood up, so I stood up with him. Then he felt me. I'm not going to make any decision right now. I need time to think. I'll let you know when I'm ready to discuss things further. That's it for part 1. Hit like and subscribe to stay tuned for more captivating stories on Sorry What.